And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Seeds of Seeds of Wars, and and is cur and is currently kickstarting the application of the of the project of the same name, the one and only Jason Sperry. How are you doing tonight, man? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you very much. Um, it strikes me with your intro that perhaps I should have had brandy <laughs> instead of water next to me. I'll, I'll remember that if this happens again. <laughs> Oh, uh, it worked for it worked for the um, it worked for that guy that guy at Le Ma that guy at Le Mans in the fifties. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we do. We have our Kickstarter going, and uh, and we're up to about ten thousand euros. Mm -hmm. So we're making progress, but uh, we are going to need a lot more support mm -hmm. to make this thing awesome. So, well, I hope to help out in what in what ways I can I can with uh, with this. So. A bit of a uh, a bit of a um a bit ah English. <laughs> it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, what was your introduction to role playing games? What made it stick for you, and how did you get introduced to this project? Okay. Well, I started with um, the second edition of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons mm -hmm. and the second edition of Vampire the Masquerade, kind of in tandem. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've, I've always been, been pretty fascinated by various role-playing styles. Uh, I, at my table, try to get a little heavy with it, explore philosophy or uh, existential questions. Um, one genre of tabletop game that I found a couple decades ago that really grabbed me was the strategy role play genre. And there have been a few. There was Birthright, there's Infernum, there's um there was a game of bones where you played drow houses and so forth. Mm -hmm. And just the the Kriegstands that you can that you can invoke by having competitive macro role play is really cool. And so I was a uh, I was an avid follower of Birthright.net and of Seeds of Wars when it first uh, hit the market, and I was following that original book Kickstarter. And about midway through the project, the the main developer of it, uh, Nicholas Nyert, uh, also called Blade. Um, he asked for a little more writing help. And just as a fan, I was like, I'd be glad to. And well, I've, I've been with the company ever since. Now, when it, when it comes to, now first off, when it comes to seeds of seeds of wars, do you consider, do you consider it its own, its own thing? Do you consider it a supplement to other role-playing games that some, that somebody might develop? Where does it fall within that particular paradigm? You can play Seeds of Wars independently, um, but the real key to this to this system, what makes it special, is when you involve it with another game. What we call it is either your macro epic actions, which is what we do with Seeds of Wars, mm -hmm. or your personal micro actions, which is what you do with whatever role-playing game you want to use. And we say you try to zoom out to talk about what the kingdom is doing uh, about civil unrest, about income, about diplomatic issues, and then you zoom in to where the characters can actually go on adventures and participate in intrigue on a more personal level, like you would in in D and D or Vampire or in any other role playing game that that people commonly get into. Mm -hmm. Now, when I when I looked at um, Seeds of Wars. One of the things that I could that I couldn't help but notice was the was the the di the different um, pillars when it com when it comes to uh, when it comes to a realm, um, magic, order, faith, trade, and culture. And 
the, what, it, what it very much reminded me of is the different types of resources that you would see in a 4X game, especially a 4X game like um, like the Endless series, Endless um, Space 1 and 2 and Endless Legend with their FIDs. Were, were 4X games a bit of an, were 4X games a bit of an influence? Uh, no, not really. That wasn't the direction we were coming from. I mean, uh, I've been more of a tabletop strategy player, and Blade has been more into civilization and into uh, into a couple of other video games, as well as we both had a mutual interest in Birthright in particular. Yeah. Um, and so I would say that that those are more our direct influences. One I actually played... Um, when I was working on Seeds of Wars that caught my attention was Pathfinder Kingmaker. And as I was playing that, I was thinking a lot about what I was going to do with certain things in Seeds of Wars. Yeah. Now, when it... Now, because of... because So, it would be fair to say that, th that it's more for the macro end, end of things. But something I'm, cur something I'm curious about is there... Would you cons would you consider this to be fully setting agnostic, fully um, style agnostic, or is this or is this something that leans towards high fantasy? Um, I actually personally like to use it in a slightly more low magic way. Mm -hmm. Um, and you could go very high fantasy with it. I, I would say. Thinking about D and D settings, I could go anywhere from full on Forgotten Realms. To something a lot more moderate, like uh, maybe one of the Elizabethan setting supplements, uh, or or something like that. I I think anything that has a a fantasy or medieval, as long as it has an idea of magic, I actually think honestly it wouldn't be that hard to pull the obvious magic out of it, the realm spells and so forth, and you could even make it for a more realistic medieval setting that would be very doable um could that could something like this be used for a more sword and sorcery style approach like say dark sun oh it's funny you should ask about dark sun because during the play test one of my play tests was i let all of my players play the seven sorcerer kings of the tier region mm -hmm. and set up each of the city states as a seeds of wars realm and do a little bit of competition that way. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun. All right, I got gotcha. you. Now, now taking now taking that into taking that into account when it um when it when it comes to um when it comes to what when it comes to wealth influence and um actions because I I saw the um the flow of adjusting loyalty then then collecting income paying paying expenses and then and then action rounds when it comes to the economy of actions would it be a case where each realm would only have one action or would they have multiple ones depending on what they have available well what i generally do with my group is i try to play one full season a turn of actions and in a season, then each month is going to allow one action for a particular leader. In addition, you can have up to five um, advisors that allow you bonus actions. Um, so the most you could get is eight actions per turn. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there are ways that you can manipulate that to sort of kind of get some other actions if you know how to manipulate the system a bit. But by and large, you're going to get at least three actions per domain turn. Mm -hmm. And now when it comes now, um, within the, within that approach, I saw, I've, I've of course seen that in the, um, de in the demo, each of each faction within, within a given area has their, has their, has, are there are of their own types and of their own um, levels? Um, uh, what now? When it comes to when it comes to the types, what can you tell me about them? And when it come and um, where does level between those individual factions take into come into play and the overall level of the county? Okay. Well, 
The level of the individual county is mostly a representation of population, um, though it could also imply something about the advancement of the individual society and how they're able to manage their resources. You, you know, some of that is some of that's interpretable, especially when you do the zoom in and you look at it from the personal angle. That's when you really have to answer that question of, well, why does this county have such a high rating? But it's strongly implied that it has to do with the adaptability of the inhabitants because, of course, for instance, if you have dwarves in the mountains, then they're allowed to go to a slightly higher level overall because that's just more their natural habitat. Um, and those rules can be modified in particular settings if you have a race to your local world or, or you have a certain culture to your local world that, that is very particularly adapted. I find myself thinking of the Fremen in Dune would be able to have a much higher level in the in the sands of Arrakis than anybody else would be able to. Yeah. Um, the then individual asset levels are what represent sort of the percentage control of that local populace within a certain context. So, taking a temple as an easy example then if you had uh, a county of six and you had two temples that had ratings of three, you might say that approximately 50% of the population worship at each of those centers. All right. that may, like, And um, would it also be fair to say that because when I opened up the demo, of course, I saw the whole thing of county level and county level limit. Um, does the county level limit um, main, mainly go into the highest level that a faction can have in that um, county? Yes, that's true. We do have it limited so that if you have a province of six, that means you could only have six total levels of a given type of asset within that particular county. Which... Which... That I can definitely uh, see that now. So in the previous example where I had the two temples of three and three, mm -hmm. there's no room for any significant temple presence there other than those two temples. They've pretty much used up what's available. Yeah. Now, when it comes now, um, there, there's um, four, there's four other factors that are in the demo that I that I wanted to that I wanted to ask on um, connections. Fortifications, prestige, and seafaring. What can okay. you tell me about those? Well, those are those are features, um, constructions, really that you can that you can put in a particular province. You can build connections mm -hmm. at their basic level. We're talking about woodland tracks, dirt roads, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you go high enough, we're talking about military highways with extensive bridges that you could actually move cavalry and artillery across. Um, uh, fortifications is going to represent anything from a key fort along a narrow pass to perhaps a, a massive construction that, you know, you could the Great Wall of China could be a fortification. Um, prestige has to do with the entertainment and the available embassies in a particular location for diplomacy and the affluence of a court. And you have additional little features like, uh, like the actual embassies themselves or like uh, spy networks mm -hmm. that, that also get added on to those features. Um, one thing that we did in, in our map and that we added to our game is we also gave GMs uh, features that they can assign so that you can say that a certain province, well, a certain county, you might have a certain level of fortifications there, but it might also be uh, considered a rugged county if we're talking about that, si that situation that I mentioned, like the fort on the mountain pass. And then that adds to the effective fortification of that county. So we did that because we like the idea of people actually being in competition for specific counties, not just because it's more land and more levels, mm -hmm. but because there's something special about a particular county that's worth fighting for. Yeah. Now, with the, with that in mind, I'd I would like to pivot a bit towards the towards the app. 
Now, was I know that I know that the I know that the um, app was um, listed as a stretch goal in the in the original Kickstarter for Se for Seeds of Wars, but what was that was that something that you guys had always had always planned for down, for down the road that the, that the app was going to be a companion in in one form or another in all honesty the app is the main product <laughs> our goal all along was to was to create a web app and the way that this project actually came into being was that uh, blade wanted to create a web app to help people play birthright because it was a very crunchy game and very hard to track all of the factors. And it, it made it not very accessible. It made it a very niche product because a lot of players don't want to deal with that amount of prep work. So he wanted to make a web app, but Birthright has been quiet for many years. And he did contact Wizards of the Coast and they aren't interested in doing anything with it. And that put him in a strange position because as much as he loved strategy role play, he didn't want to keep doing all that prep work. So he realized that he would have to do a whole lot more prep work once and design an entire system and setting so that he could then write his web app. Yeah. I'm guessing that I'm guessing that's how the setting of Ceres was created. Exactly. And I I know that I know that it's that it's mentioned that this is compatible with um, D and D five E and um, Pathfinder, but a fair amount of a fair amount of my stu of my students um, use fantasy games that might be considered a little non-standard. Um, one one chief example among that is Fantasy Craft, which is a very very elaborate reworking of the mechanics within. Um, with it within the three point five style of the D twenty system, would some would um I'm not going would something like that work within um within Seeds's sandbox? Not only within Seeds of Wars, even if you wanted to run in series, you could potentially do that. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, I mean, COVID has affected all of us, and my in person tabletop game had to be halted. So I'm starting up a stream, which we will, by the way, have on the Seeds of Wars YouTube, where I am going to be running a game using 3.5 mechanics mm -hmm. from my microsystem. I, I actually love the way that it blends with it, and I'm a big fan of 3.5 because it's so easy to introduce to players and the PDFs are everywhere. Yeah. Um, like, I, I, um... I will admit to being par to being partial to, I guess what I guess what you would say are extensive hacks of, of um the three point five setup. Ven <laughs> well, Pathfinder is basically an extensive hack of the three point five setup, right? You know, you can. It, it is, <laughs> use but it does like. it, it is, but it doesn't quite. It, but um, Fantasy Craft left a much bigger impression on me because it wasn't interested in preserving some of D&D's traditions. It was interested in blowing it up and starting fresh with with maximum customization being one of the keys. Also, they fit, they managed to make feats not drive me up a wall. So <laughs> that's an edge that that they had. Um yeah, I I can feel you on that absolutely. Um you could use it honestly you could use it with a no dice system if you wanted to for your micro game. If when you get into the the role playing of the individual characters, mm -hmm. you find that it's better not to use any published system, that's not going to hurt your ability to play Seeds of Wars at all. I even got an email from someone who was interested in potentially adapting it for a live action role playing game. You know, I mean, we tried to make it as malleable as we could while still giving verisimilitude with the mechanics themselves. And when it now um when it comes to the when it comes to the setup for the for the um app now I have spent a fair amount of time with the with the demo but is it is this going to be one of those situations where someone would where someone would have to make the map within their setup or could they 
upload an image and use that as a basis for the map. Yes, absolutely. You could take a map of, oh, Eberron or Dark Sun or wh wherever you want. You upload it, and the app will allow you to draw borders, and then it'll let you input all of the levels. And if, now, if, the, if you haven't converted this world for use in macro play, you do have a project ahead of you. Yeah. Um, in fact, that's one reason why in the core book, at the end of the core book, it, it kind of hit us in the middle of writing it. I did an essay specifically about adapting game worlds. And it's not that hard, but it can be tedious. And one reason that we like doing the application is because that way, once you enter these values, it can track them all for you. Because mm -hmm. a big a big reason that I, that I asked something like that is, I have had my fair share of fun with um with a with a procedural generator when it comes to fantasy a fantasy map. I've used it in a couple streams to um, randomly generate settings. Um, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes with um, unfortunate results, like the like the incident last week with the Blackian theocracy, and that was the name that was picked. I didn't do it. <laughs> um, and with and so with some with something like with, some, with something like that, and and. What I'd I'd obviously have I'd obviously have a bit have a bit of a project on my hands just because I'd have to um, draw when it comes to drawing in the um, the board the borders regions and the like mm -hmm. is is that something that there's a bit of assistance on or is it fair or is it fairly free form? You know, to be honest, those functionalities haven't been designed yet, and that's the kind of input that will be really good as we go. Uh, Will it just be free form like with a paintbrush, mm -hmm. or will there be an option to do a uh, to do a sort of drag where it'll conform to a shape to create a county or a realm? That's the kind of thing that could still be edited if there's a strong cry one way or the other. Once we actually get this web app funded, then that's when the real work's going to begin. Yeah. Now the other th the other thing, of course, that I see is is the um, coat of arms and i'm curious now i can i can guess that um text would be editable but when it comes to the coat of the coat of arms itself is that is that something that you've um planned on having at least at least a at least a set of um gra at least a set of graphics for people to build on well, we don't have a library established for it, but you will have an account within the app, mm -hmm. and there's no reason you can't have an avatar attached to that account. And there are also coats of arms within the individual realms. So if you're creating realms, then uh, we'll do what we can to make sure you can put coats of arms in there. The specific functionalities of how that would work, though, they aren't established yet. Mm -hmm. So, again... Anything like that that you're that you're particular about and you want to see, make sure we know and and we'll try to do what we can with it. Yeah. yeah. Um. The main the main reason that the main reason that kind of thing is in the back of my mind is because I I know that not ev not everybody who DMs is an artist, and I could see I and um even with even with tools like Incarnate I can see some people. Being a little bit more intimidated on map making than others. Well, one thing you'll be able to do, by the way, is you'll actually be able to share maps that you make with the community. Mm -hmm. And what that means that I'm very excited about is if someone, because a couple of people in our Discord have already suggested they will, if someone does the work to create a really phenomenal setting and, and they, for instance, design beautiful coats of arms and... Uh, and get all your borders set up and so forth, and they're willing to share it, well, then anybody who wants to play in that world can play in that world. You know, run your own campaign there. So there's a lot of potential for this app, uh, even for people who don't want to do too much drawing themselves. In the beginning, of course, series is ready to go, and uh, and it's a very, it's a fun setting. It has a lot of character. Um, and then... Once you've played in series, by the time you're done there, I'm sure there will be some other options that you can upload. Yeah. And 
when it comes now when it comes to when it comes now when it com when it com when it comes to using using this for uh, for um other genres I've, there there I realized that this one that this might be a little bit tricky but do you th is there the possibility that seeds that someone could adapt seeds of wars into so into something that leans a little bit more on the space end of things where instead of dealing Absolutely. with instead of dealing with individual planets they're dealing with or sorry instead of they're dealing with individual um countries and and their factions they're dealing with planets that is our key plan the uh the science fiction adaptation of Seeds of Wars is, I think, it's number three on our list right now. After the app, and then we, we have a comic book that we're going to put out. Mm -hmm. um, then the very next thing after that is the, it's the science fiction setting. And if you read the, the core book, um, the hints are pretty strong in there that this is going to turn into a science fiction setting. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's all ready to go in that way. And... Um, Hopefully, I'll be writing a lot of that too. It's I'm really excited about that. Now, since you mentioned the idea of using this for low magic, I'm curious how how you'd handle magical factions if you're dealing with a setting that's either low magic or just straight or just straight up historical fantasy and isn't using any magic at all, a la Game of Thrones. Well, you could simply eliminate that faction type. Mm -hmm. Um. But another thing you could do is, for instance, when thinking about a temple, temples still have all the economic power and political power, even without the realm magic. So you could have a set of temples with no realm spells, and you could even perhaps give some sort of edge to temples, some extra benefit to compensate for that lack of magic. You know, you can tweak these rules as you like. And we'll do what we can with the app to make it tweakable. Um, but one thing you will be able to do in the app, certainly, is adjust values by hand. So if you as a game master have something going on in your world that doesn't match the standard fantasy milieu, mm -hmm. you should be able to adjust values to account for that as you go. Um, we... We very strongly like to rely on game masters, and we wrote the game with the idea of strong game masters. So there are lots of intentional ways that game masters can manipulate outcomes without having to ever fudge a dice roll. Which I, I can def I can definitely uh, get I can definitely get behind that, um, especially especially since, as I mentioned with the with that previous project, um, the the magic system that we ended up creating for that setting, it would be on such a level that if we tried to convert that to, say, Pathfinder, it wouldn't work. Because we ended up creating a magic system that was concept-based instead of list-based. And that, bring, that, brings me to, that brings me to the question of, when it comes to... When it comes to using the using the magic um, faction ac actions, geez, there's a, there's a bad rhyme. There's my bad rhyme quota for the day. Um, would it be would it be able to be used um, with a with a concept based style of magic? Yes, I think so. The real the first question you'd have to answer, and since we just talked about temples, I'll talk about actual magic ratings. Mm -hmm. Is you have to think about what magic ratings mean in your world. In series, it's the presence of marine nanotechnology and the ancient sites in which people are able to commune with the ancestors and the sky gods and so forth. Mm -hmm. But in your world, you have to think about what does a magic rating mean? And if a magic rating supplies magic, such as let's go to Dark Sun and say that a magic rating is based on the plant life in the area because you're a defiler. Mm -hmm. Well, you could develop specific mechanics around the magic rating being affected by the plant life in the area. You could actually give penalties or bonuses based on that. And when it comes to the styles of magic themselves, such as concept-based magic, I think the real answer, assuming your source of power is effective as a magic rating, that that works for your, your, your magic system. Yeah. 
then the real trick is just changing your realm spells. You could have a more versatile realm spell where you pay a certain wealth and influence, and then you have an effect that's more negotiable with the GM. All right. Um, since you since you mentioned um, since since you mentioned Pathfinder. Uh, and because because this is something that's gotten extensive use at some of at some of the tables I've been in, have you ever heard of a um, of a spellcasting alternative called Spheres of Power? Well, um, what comes to mind for me is Mage the Awakening. Is that what you're talking about? Um, this Spheres of Power it radically changes um, the spellcasting setup for Pathfinder, and they're also working on a um, conversion for D and D Fifth Edition, where it is co where it is concept based and um, ta and talent based. Um, instead instead of provide instead of providing characters with a um, spell list, that's why I was asking about the whole idea of ha of using concept based um, magic actions. I don't think that that hurts the macro play or changes the macro play in any way. It's just a matter of uh, having different realm spells available that might function in a different way. Because what you're talking about mostly seems to me things that would be relevant to personal play and adventuring and casting spells individually. Mm -hmm. um, now, you could tweak the system in Seeds of Wars, for instance... Uh, there are plenty of magic systems that don't recognize the idea of the priestly magic. I mean, anyone who has magic is uh, is a mage in Dragon Age, regardless of whether it's healing or whatever else. Mm -hmm. um, in such a case, you could, instead of having the magic asset and the temple asset, you could have the fire asset and the void asset, you know, if that better fits your magic system. Which makes which makes sense. Um, I when it come now when it comes to um bat, when it comes to some something like battles. Now I did see the um I did see the map that you had, that you had set up, and I'm I'm curious if the if the um if warfare is planned to be integrated into this app as well. It will be. There are two different ways you can do it. Either you can use the system presented in the Seeds of Wars core book and use miniatures. And I'm a big fan of that even with the map because it's just it's fun to play with miniatures. Um, but we also have a quick resolution system in the book that doesn't require miniatures. And we're going to have that quick resolution system adapted within the app so that you can engage in battle with the quick resolution system. I should say that if you do decide to do it with miniatures mm -hmm. um, or, or cards or however you would like to represent it, it hey, if you want to use a whole different battle system and instead of using Seeds of War's battle system, you want to use Warhammer, you can do that, you know? And then you can just adjust the results in the values of the involved teams the involved factions manually. The GM can go in, you know, after you used your Warhammer battles to fight your battle and you lost, well, the GM can adjudicate how much that affects your ratings in Seeds of Wars. All right, I can, now, me per, now, me personally, I could see myself using um, the Ninth Age, which was, which is um, what, which was what was created after everybody got angry with um, the end times for Warhammer. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah well we did our best to make this game rather modular mm -hmm. that was one of the tricks to make it system agnostic so that if you want to you can take a whole chapter of that book and just set it aside and and insert your own version of things you know if you don't like our magic system that's fine if you don't like our war system also fine you could use a different one Without interfering with the way the macro system overall works. Yeah. And speaking speaking of that, there is one there is one game that I have been a fan of for almost twenty years that I could easily see slotting in, slotting and integrating within that within this, and I'd I'd say it would I'd say it would actually be a natural fit. 
Um, well, it's funny because if it's 20 years old, then maybe I even know what you're talking about. <laughs> are you familiar with Legend of the Five Rings? I am. Yes, absolutely. Um, I have a couple editions on my shelves. Mm -hmm. I, I played the cards a little bit once upon a time, and I did play the, uh, the 3.5 adaptation, too. Cool setting. Yeah, I, um, I, will, I will freely admit I did... I, um, the three point the three point five setup it was around the days of second edition, which is in the hall of I don't talk about that because they tried they tried to um they tried to play both sides at the same time, trying to do both roll and keep and d twenty in the same books, which is going to have problems. Um, but get but given the emphasis on political maneuvering that happens so much within Legend of the Five Rings. And the fact that outright combat is... De personal combat is highly de-emphasized compared to other fantasy games. This is... It's something I could see... I could see um, fitting in very naturally with Seas of Wars' um, sandbox. I would deeply love to see that adapted for it. That would be absolutely great. Um, uh, great... I'd say I'd say the only thing that might be slightly tricky is the is um, realm magic, and that's sim and that's simply because of the fact that magic use in L five R is not the same as you would see in a in a more European influenced one. Um, Shugenja are vi are are not are not the wizard hold up in its t in its tower or anything like that. They are far more integrated. Yeah, and that's one of those systems where I think that you'd have to revise the whole concept of the magic asset and the temple asset and think about what they mean in your game. Any of these major adaptations, of course, they're going to be a challenge. It's going to be some work. But I'm going to spend time adapting them when I can. And uh, if we're lucky, some of our users will spend time adapting some of them. I've already had comments from a couple of people that they will take particular maps and settings and adapt them and upload them to the app. So I can't wait to see what we end up with. The other one, the other one that I can that I could see I could see someone potentially trying to trying to adapt it, especially given its popularity, is Pendragon. Okay. Um, and the main reason I say that is because when you can when you consider how how the macro turn for Seeds of Wars is set up, Pendragon already has a phase within its within its particular sandbox that oh that um would fit that would easily fit like a glove when it comes to the winter phase. Yeah, and and the thing is, some games will do really well with the zooming in and zooming out. Mm -hmm. For some games, there's a very natural pattern of, ah, we have adventured for one month, now we want to see what's happening in the larger world, or the turn of the seasons can bring that sort of thing on. And, um, and even, I mean, everything is adjustable at your table. Obviously, it's a little more limited with a web app, but... You could even at your table adjust the number of uh, the number of actions you can take within a given turn if that really does better fit your world. Yeah, and what now when it comes to the when it comes now when it comes to the um at the app it's the app itself, I do I did see the um the the um. Image regarding what what appear what appears to be at what appears to be the um, actions, um, is it would a lot of it be a ca be a case of where the D the DM or the players would go would go through the actions and then um, the rest is automated. Oh well, some of the functionalities are not yet totally decided. Um, the GM will always be able to do everything. Yeah. We are looking into a stretch goal that would allow players to propose actions through email that would then be okayed by the GM. Um, exactly what direction this goes and how much we can put into it really depends how much backing we get. Um, I can tell you that we intend from the outset for 
a uh, a light AI to just sort of passively advance the factions that aren't being played so that they realistically grow. So if you don't crawl across the map and then you find people still in their starting state when you've been playing for six months of game time, you know. Um, but as far as like the actual automated functionality of the app, keep in mind that our primary goal here is actually just to assist the playing of the game rather than make it feel more like a video game. So what we want to do first, if we, if we just get the basic backing, is we just want to make sure that GMs have a way to input and track everything and that they have a way to show all of that or whatever they want to their players. The more time that we have to work with it, the more likely that we can actually get some more interactive, direct action within the app. All right, that, that makes sense. And when it comes to... Now, the other reason I mentioned um, Pendragon is it can it kind of has a inbuilt assumption that a set that one ga that one game session is equivalent to one is equivalent to one year of in-game time um with seeds of with the macro set up with seeds of wars would it operate on a similar manner that um, one ter one turn within that is equivalent to one year or did you guys intend for that for that macro turn time to be more flexible. The pace at which we have it written is going to be four full turns of play within a calendar year of the game world. It's each season. Mm -hmm. um, I immediately can think of some ways that your micro personal game could run once a year and your macro game could run through four times. Uh, I'd have to sit down with the system and really think about what I thought would be the most artful way to present it. But that's what that's what GMs do, you know? So I, I can't wait to see what anybody does to handle that specifically. Mm -hmm. Now, wh now um, when it when it comes to when it comes now when it comes to fa when it comes to um factions. And obvious obviously e obviously each will have well, each faction has its own sets of um a of actions. Um, given the given the fact that you had you had mentioned pre you had mentioned previously that there's been a bit of influence in the team with um civilization. Um, had there been any thought of put of putting in of putting in some equivalent to tech trees, or was that or was that thrown out rather quickly? Well, on this one, that was thrown out rather quickly because there's already so much to manage with the loyalty and with the income and with the various features of the individual counties. And then you can build multiple levels of your different constructions, such as you, one person's going to have a more advanced seaport than another as it is. Mm-hmm. We decided that trying to make such a tree would be a little overwhelming for playing without computer assistance. And so even though we're making the web app because we want to try and make this more accessible, it's still important that it be playable to people even just with books and dice. Yeah. Now with the science fiction setting, I can't say that we'll prioritize the same things. Our whole idea of features may change a little bit when we start talking about worlds and spaceships and what what sort of science fiction we're going to bring into it. Which that um, that definitely makes sense. Um, it's it, and the main reason I ask that kind of thing is is just on just on a matter of um, of my experiences with four X's and. Truth be t truth be told, if I was to try and integrate a tech tree, it wouldn't it wouldn't be a tree in that kind of situation. It would be it would be more akin to the um, to the to the um, pools of technology that's in um, the endless series, where you just you just grab what you want, and after a certain amount of um, things that you grab, you can move on to the next age and grab things from that age as well. More of a tier thing than a um, than a tree. Or in the case in, 
In the case of Seeds of Wars and the fantasy core book mm -hmm. and series, uh, people can advance their individual military units in any one of a number of parameters, even get special non-human type units, mm -hmm. which could vary by campaign world. They can also research and create new realm spells. There are also magical artifacts that can modify the mechanics of how the world works. So there's a lot of very fantastic customization available there. I can tell you that when we get to the science fiction setting, and this is looking pretty far in the future, so we'll see when we get there. But one thing I would go into it thinking is not only would I want to adapt Seeds of Wars for science fiction, I would want to try a few different ideas mechanically to give it a different mechanical flavor. And one thing that would give us is if people would prefer to use the, let's just say we develop a tech tree in the science fiction game. Mm -hmm. If they like the tech tree system better than the feature system, what I hope to do is make both of these systems complementary so that your, your table, you could take modular parts from one and from another and, I don't know, make a modern setting or whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. And especially since I, I um, given given what's given what's going to be shaking out in the in the video game re realm and how and how though how a lot you have a whole generation of people who for them video game and ta and tabletop gaming are interconnected with each other. It's inevitable that I th I think somebody's going to ask about use about using a bit more a bit more of a a bit more of an emphasis on a individual city rather than um a ma rather than a full on world people have already asked about that and um it, you can do it now you could split up counties to be the different districts of a city and you could that's one reason we kept things like wealth vague Mm -hmm. is because wealth means a different thing to a city than it does to an empire, but we can still just call it wealth. Um, so all you would really have to do is change the scale. You could absolutely build a map that was... In fact, one of my playtests was set in the city of Dor, set in Sigil in Planescape, and we just split the wards into the individual counties and played it that way. Yeah. Um, I could... Because... Obviously, with with um, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven right around the corner, I and the fact that Cyberpunk Red is is already out, I wouldn't be surprised if some people would want to would want to do some macro stuff when it comes to the corporations and Night City. I hope so. And you know, before we even get around to writing the science fiction version, you can modify the fantasy version pretty easily to account for that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Like I said, change the scale and then just get rid of magic and replace it with technology and have the realm spells become technological super moves of some kind and yeah. you're already set for a basic game. I'll try to give you more detail if they let me write the science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> um but when it comes to that I could I can I can easily see I can easily see it for some for some up uh, for some other aspects especially since night city is that it would be would be a natural fit because because of how the districts are very theme based but also the also the fact that there's no shortage of themed gangs to the point where i'd say the only the only piece of media i've seen that has more themed gangs within a, within a setting was the warriors movie and that's probably a deep cut on my part <laughs> I'm going to play that game to death. I've already pre-ordered it. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, if nobody else gets around to it and I have time, I'll adapt it myself. <laughs> but uh, but I could ease I could easily see um trade and culture factions being re being rechristened into corps and gangs. Yes, absolutely. And that is the sort of thinking that a Seeds of Wars GM really is going to need. Mm -hmm. it, when you're adapting it to a new world, you just have to think about, what does the law mean in my world? What does it mean when I say somebody controls an order asset? You know? 
And that can vary strongly from one culture to another. Which uh, I can, I can, def I can definitely uh, see. And the reason, the reason I'd, fo the reason I'd focus, I'm focusing specifically on on adapting it for that is when when some when something is advertised as set as setting agno as setting agnostic, it's one of those cases where pe where um. The first lesson that has to be learned for a lot of people is that not all fantasy, not all science fiction is created equal. There are a myriad of of genres and subgenres, and hell, I had to expose I had to expose somebody to what um, Adam Punk is earlier this week. And when it and all and all the other all, all myriad of other different types of blank punk that that is that is within fiction right and the best that we can do is that we can go for something that's as mechanically middle of the road as possible but is still we can still make our individual setting fun and then leave the whole thing loose enough that people can make it their own yeah when i write even for my own table i tend to refer to it as uh as a skeletal writing, you know, like up first I'm just building the bones of the operation and then I wait and see what people do before I start worrying about the organs and the skin. Yeah. So another reason, that, another reason for leaning into a bit of the ur uh, urban aspect is, well, for me personally, I'm a big fan of um, Brandon Sanderson's work. Espe well, especially Mistborn. Yeah, and you know what? There was um, there was the Jim Butcher novels. There was a role playing game that came out for Harry Dresden not too long ago. Yes, and I could absolutely see doing something with that here. Mm -hmm. Like I like I said, this this sort of thing I can e I can easily see the um, the mo the um, the modularity really be really being tested. And to see how far away from what I've called the Tolkien melting pot that people can get from it. Oh, and I hope they do. And we've already had requested specific supplements detailing the individual kingdoms in series. Mm -hmm. And within those individual supplements, I may be able to present some optional rules specific to those realms. And I could even see if we have the request for it. I see no reason why we couldn't write specific adaptations that actually give modified rules for individual settings or styles. That's something that we would rise to. And not only that, but we're always open to contributions from the fan base. I was a fan before I joined the company. So, you know, if somebody has a really great idea, <laughs> we'll run with it. Yeah. Me personally, I could, I could easily see myself using this for, um, a, for a um, for something I've been working on for the last couple of years called Project Gaia, um, especially especially given the especially given the scope that that thing has with the old with its old and new continents, even if it does lean a little bit into Magipunk slash steampunk. Um, but even even with even with leaning into a bit of Magitech when it comes to it. Um, I think it would still fit within within Seas of Wars because what I'm noticing, and you can let me know if this was some, if this was something that was consciously done. A lot of the stuff within Seas of War is more rooted in effects than in origins. Yes, that is intentional because the origins are often the kind of thing that you detail in a personal campaign. Mm -hmm. And so the intentional goal here is I want you to be able to cast big magic spells. That's that this is a fantasy game, but what does it mean when you cast big spells? That's between you and the GM. If you're playing in series, we've given one answer for it, but if you're playing in another world, then, well, it, it just really de depends what we have planned. And yes, when you refer to the, the Tolkien bandwidth, you know, something actually that uh, Tracy Hickman wrote about the Dragonlance novels is 
if there's no reason to change something from what people expect, leave it because that makes the things you do change all the more poignant. Mm-hmm. Um, I I use I use the I use the uh, Tolkien mel- melting pot as as um. It's kind. It's kind of a long. It's kind of a long running. It's kind of a long running in joke. And the the only time I ever really bring it up is when um, when I've seen people make arguments about something about something being quote unquote too weird to count as fantasy. Um, I distinctly remember hearing people say that in some forums about Planescape. <laughs> well, their marketing pitch was fantasy taken to the edge. Yeah, and. I've seen that just as much when it comes to Numenera, even though it's kind of self it's kind of self defeating to remark that because Numenera is some, is meant to be weird. It's meant to first off, it's meant to be a spiritual successor to Planescape, and second off, the whole idea with everything in Numenera is taking Clark's law to a logical extreme. Yeah, Numenera is beautiful. He's done a really great job with that stuff. And and I'm really glad that, you know, as you say, there is a spiritual successor to Planescape. Because even though Dungeons and Dragons still has all that material, they don't embrace the theme of it that way anymore. But like I said, I already used um, Seeds of Wars in Sigil. I also have a prototype idea for using Seeds of Wars for the Blood War. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know... You, you you can do what you want. Yeah. Now. When now um I know you I know you guys have twenty five days to go on the on the Kickstarter. Um, now uh, now for now for what I'm about to ask, just to make sure I don't tempt the gods of irony. Okay. Okay, I'll knock on mine too. Table wood. Um. What would you be sh- what re- what window would you be shooting for as far as a re- as far as a um release window for ju- for just the alpha? You know, Nico answered this question, and I don't remember the answer to it. I'm mm-hmm. sorry. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick. All right. But I believe he did give an estimate for how long he thought it would be before the alpha got out. Uh, I don't see his answer, but I want to say January. I, I really do. I want to say January. Mm-hmm. Don't quote me. I might, I might not be right about that, but I think January. All right. I've, now, obviously, obviously, I'm not, obviously, I'm not, ex- I'm not expecting to have that, na- have that kind of thing nailed down, which is why, which is why I said release window. Because yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's what I that's what I think, but I'm not absolutely certain about it. Um, obviously, it depends how much backing we get, because the more backing we have, the more we can afford to have some help on the development. You know. Mm-hmm. And when it com- and when it comes and um, when it comes to that, you already you already mentioned having a um, having a sizable community asking a, asking a whole lot of questions. So I could easily see people coming in to find ways to bend or break um, what's there what's there early on because well that's what a beta is for. Yeah, please do. <laughs> the more exploits you find in a system, the the better it is for the people observing how the system works. Lord knows nobody wants another blood plague incident. <laughs> what, what is the blood plague incident? What did I miss? Um, this was this was a rather infamous bug that happened in the early days of World of Warcraft. There was okay. a there was a there was a um there was an end game raid boss who could inflict a debuff called Corrupted Blood, which would sap your health at a pretty alarming rate. But if you passed and if you passed by um other um ca- other characters during the during the fight, they could get stuck with it too. But okay. there was yeah, one. This, there is, was, this is ringing a bell. I've seen this mechanic before. Yeah, okay. there was one little oversight that was that was made that um ended up causing the whole game to go into meltdown mode, which is the fact that hunters had pets and pets could catch it as well. And all the worse, they could take they could take that effect and bring it outside of the area it was designed for. Oh and wow! Then shit hit the fan. 
<laughs> so there were plagues in Orgrimmar, huh? I like it. Even even worse if somebody who had it went to say a shop NPC and and um sp and spoke with that a request giver or the like, then they didn't then they'd end up carrying it asymptomatically. Oh wow! Yeah, wow. the whole the whole thing the whole thing got ridiculously out of hand really fast. About when was this? This was a this was a long time ago. I'd say I'd say it was in the first couple. I'd say it was in the first couple of years of WoW's development. I can't remember the exact year, but it was it was quite a while ago. But it's be, but it was so infamous that the event was researched by real world epidemiologists. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think we'll have anything so extreme because, again, mm -hmm. um, what we're making here starts as a bookkeeping and visual map based app. Um, and the functionalities are going to be introduced slowly based on the player base, what we actually need in particular. Um, and the developers. Nico, in particular, are they're careful people. I mean, of course, there will be bugs in anything, but I don't think we'll have a blood plague unless I, I insist that we put one as an Easter egg for your sake. Um, if if that if that ends up getting put in, I'll just I'll um, uh, I'll pro I'll probably end up falling off my chair laughing. But the reason <laughs> the reason I bring up that kind of thing is. It's a, it's a um, cautionary tale about how one small oversight can balloon out of, can balloon out of control if not kept in check. Oh yeah, well the amount of details in writing the book were were exhausting, and I myself am no coder, but I I know enough of them that I see those windows and those tabs with the opacity set so that you can see them in layers and. Um, I can see how a point might get lost here and there. Yeah, which 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 is which is why it um, which is why beta testing is so is so important. To, especially yeah, and since... our developing te our development team is very experienced, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't worry about them. Yeah. They're, they're pretty talented. I mean, just look at what they did for the Kickstarter. Yeah. it's all great. I I know. I'm I'm fairly I'm fairly. I have I have full confidence in them, and I have full confidence that they that um they have that they have had to that if if they had enough time, they'd probably be singing ninety nine little bugs in the code. <laughs> if if we had infinite time and money, then you know we'd just straight up integrate it with uh, with Cyberpunk, and you wouldn't have to do an adaptation at all. But oh, there are limits to what that, you can do. <laughs> that's a uh, Ninety nine bugs in the code is a it is a bit is a bit of a running joke among among some of my friends who are programmers. Um, one of them put it on a uh, mouse pad. You know, ninety nine little bugs in the code. Ninety nine bit ninety nine bugs in the code. You take one down, patch it around. One hundred little bugs in the code. The problem for me is I don't think that my eyes could keep track of that many <laughs> layers of text and and not read over what you know in fallout when you're doing the hacking on the computers and you have to look at all those lines of text to enter the various um code words oh i kind of like that mini game but staring at the numbers is a bit much for me although um you know i i would i i would i would pass judgment but then i remembered fallout 76 exists and um well, that's good. That's going to be a that's going to be a joke of mine for years because it's never going to be finished. <laughs> uh, As we say here in the Paul temple, we're not trying to hit a man while he's down. We're trying to kick him because that's easier. Well, you've got your angle right. <laughs> but with all, with all with all that said, I'll I'll definitely be keeping that keeping an eye out on the on the development and. I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on the show and um, enjoy the insanity at play here. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate it. And, and thanks for keeping track of us. I mean, you know, uh, absolutely, if you haven't yet, uh, put in your Euro so you can at least get the updates on it. We actually introduced a couple more tiers 
that were more merchandise based because mm -hmm. people really like the t-shirt and the custom dice. So we put in a couple of tiers that are focused on those instead of subscriptions. So. All right. And of, of course, anytime, anytime you see fit to return, the, do the uh, door is always open. As I often ah, say, yes, I, I would love to come pray at the temple again. <laughs> As I always say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thank you, sir. Good night. And at, and um, at, as a as a final bit, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>